Our case study overviews AJ, a 32-year-old Caucasian Nully Paris female at 41 weeks gestational age who was admitted to the hospital on September 23rd for a scheduled induction. The patient presented with no known allergies at a weight of 162 pounds and at a height of 5 feet 5 inches. The mother's pertinent prenatal lab results showed that the mother had an active immunity to rubella, no presence of group B streptococci colonization, and no presence of HIV, hepatitis B, gonorrhea, or chlamydia infection. Her pertinent medical history was assessed as a non-smoker with occasional alcohol use and a history of urinary tract infections. The patient had a scheduled induction on September 23rd at roughly 0900. At 1730, the provider elected to artificially rupture the membrane, which led to a prolonged time window of the rupture of membrane to delivery of about 14 hours. An epidural was performed on September 24th at 0100, and the time of birth was 0747, with an estimated blood loss of 500 milli. After 22 hours of labor, AJ had a temperature of 102.4, blood pressure of 125 over 77, a heart rate of 118, a respiratory rate of 26, with her abdomen being tender to the touch and fetal tachycardia present at a rate of 168 beats per minute. Our assessment concluded that the patient was ANO times 4 with complaints of dizziness and nausea, tachycardic with clear lung sounds, dry mucous membranes present with the abdomen tender to the touch and malodorous amniotic fluid with a failure to progress in labor. Chorioamniitis is a maternal infection that affects the placenta as well as the fetal membranes. A pregnant woman can get chorioamniitis via ascending bacteria coming from the vagina into the uterine cavity. Untreated chorioamniitis can lead to preterm labor, cerebral palsy, as well as multi-system organ failure. Chorioamnitis occurs during labor and affects about 10% of laboring women. The biggest risk factor for chorioamnitis is prolonged rupture of membranes. In this picture, you can see the bacteria ascending through the cervix and into the amniotic cavity, where it will affect the amniotic fluid and could potentially affect the fetus as well. The slide shows the stages of ascending intraamniotic infection. In stage 1, there is a change in the vaginal and cervical flora and the presence of pathological organisms. In stage 2, microorganisms gain access to the amniotic cavity. In stage 3, microorganisms cause intraamniotic infection. And in stage 4, microorganisms can invade the fetus. This slide shows chemotactic stimuli that bring the neutrophils into the fetal membranes. Figure A shows an increase in the amniotic fluid concentration of chemokines, which induces neutrophils to migrate towards the amnion, shown by the arrows. In figure B, the consequence is maternal neutrophils which infiltrate to the chorioamniotic membranes from the decidual vessels. The biggest risk factors for chorioamniitis include prolonged rupture of membranes in labor, but can also include preterm premature rupture of membranes, or PPROM, and prematurity, multiple digital exams with membrane rupture, positive group B strep, epidural anesthesia, internal fetal monitoring devices, and nulliparity. There are several signs and symptoms of clinical chorioamniitis, including a maternal fever greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, maternal tachycardia greater than 100 beats per minute, a white blood cell count greater than 15,000, diffuse uterine tenderness, malodorous amniotic fluid, as well as fetal tachycardia greater than 160 beats per minute. Maternal complications that can arise from untreated chorioamniitis include septic shock, acute respiratory distress syndrome, postpartum hemorrhage, and endometriosis. Fetal complications include pneumonia, meningitis, sepsis, neurodevelopmental delay, cerebral palsy, as well as multi-system organ failure. The biggest changes seen in the patient's laboratory values were her platelet count and white blood cell count. The platelets increased from 227 to 350, and her white blood cell count went from 15.8 on her day of admission to 22.5. The patient's h and and lights remained within normal limits. Treatment for choreo includes reducing maternal and fetal complications, continue fetal monitoring for any distress, administer antibiotics and antipyretics. Our patient received 3 grams of unison, which is a broad-spectrum antibiotic, every 6 hours for 24 hours, and 1 gram of Tynalol every 4 to 6 hours for fever control. Our nursing diagnosis for AJ is at risk for infection related to prolonged rupture of membranes of 14 hours. Remember, she had a fever, was tacky, had a high white blood cell count, prolonged labor of 22 hours, tender uterus, vaginal exams, signs and symptoms of fetal distress, and internal monitors.
Some goals for AJ will be to remain free of infection as evidenced by remaining free of fever as choreo is often associated with maternal fever. Second goal is having a white blood cell count less than 15,000 before discharge. Elevated white blood cells are indicative of active infection. Interventions we would use are constant monitoring of vital signs, like temperature every four hours. Assess lab work, especially white blood cell count, and make sure to report any abnormals to main provider. Also, administer antipyretics, which effectively decrease internal body temperature. The goals for AJ were unmet as she did not remain free from infection. By the end of shift, she had a temperature of 102.4 and a white blood cell count of 22.5. Patient attained chorioamnionitis as she was diagnosed by physician. She had a C-section because dilation and effacement of cervix was not progressing. Patient will continue to be monitored and managed with antibiotic, antipyretics, and analgesic therapy until she is free from infection and pain. Antibiotics or other agents during labor are safe with few side effects. If further signs of infection occur, provider will be notified. Next, our diagnosis for baby was risk for infection related to maternal status of chorioamnionitis. Remember, the fetus showed distress while in the womb. Fetal heart rate was 168. The goals for this baby are remaining free of hypothermia and blood glucose levels that will be less than 45. We want normal ranges prior to transfer. Most often, babies will show signs of infection through decreased temperature, bradycardia, hypotension, altered respirations, and hypoglycemia. Some interventions we would use are assess and monitor vital signs as needed for any complications that require immediate interventions, assess for hypoglycemia, and report abnormal values. Lastly, encourage breastfeeding and maternal bonding as soon as possible. Skin-to-skin -skin contact after birth for the newborn improve thermal regulation and cardiopulmonary stabilization. Also, human milk enhances immune defenses of the infant. Goals for the baby were met. Baby remained free of infection as evidenced by temperature between 98.3 to 98.7 and blood glucose levels above or equal to 45. The newborn remained free from infection or complications like respiratory distress, adapted to extrauterine environment while at 41 weeks. The newborn was able to latch on and breastfeed as well as have skin-to-skin -skin contact with mother as soon as he came back from the NICU, where he was observed for sepsis. Using the Newman Systems model, the medical staff was able to identify and acknowledge other stressors in the patient's life that she might face when going home with a newborn baby. The Newman Systems model is an operating framework designed to guide caregivers and administrators in helping those in their charge to manage stressors. There are five variables that play a role and contribute to stress that an individual may have. These are physiological, psychological, sociocultural, developmental, and spiritual variables. A physiological variable pertains to the human body. Because this patient had complications during her labor and delivery process, she was unable to take care of herself the way she normally would. In return, her physiological needs were not being met. The patient was not able to sleep, could not keep food down due to nausea and vomiting, and she was not able to bathe herself. The patient would experience a psychological stress variable on an emotional level. The patient and her baby experienced infection, and after the C-section, the baby was taken to the NICU. The patient and her husband were very distraught about their newborn baby. This type of variable can carry into the postpartum period and become the cause of mental health disorders such as postpartum depression and anxiety. Sociocultural variables this patient dealt with were related to her life before the birth. This patient was heavily involved with exercising and maintaining her physical fitness. This patient will not be able to return to the physically active life that she is used to. She will have to rest and refrain from activity in order to heal. A developmental variable has to do with age-related stressors. Becoming a new mother is definitely the developmental variable that this patient will deal with the most. This patient will have many questions and be uncertain of her skills in many situations. It is important that there is an adequate support system in place in order to affirm and support this new mother in her decisions.